Hello, I'm Donna Marie Thompson, PhD of BouncingBackNow.com. I'd like to welcome you to the Living Consciously TV show, where each week we explore interesting life issues, including health, wealth, happiness, relationships, and above all, living consciously. So what is the effect of living fully 85% of our lives on autopilot? And how could our lives be changed if we were attuned, if we were aware, if we knew what was going on around us, if we were living consciously? Well, I invite you to tune in each week to view our panel of experts and our featured guests as we explore these and other exciting issues. I guarantee that at the end of each show, you'll begin to live your life more consciously. Welcome to the Leaving Consciously TV show. I'm your host, Coach Steve Toth, and um, our theme for today is relationship communication. And uh, let me introduce you to our guests and also our experts that are joining us on Skype. And our guest today is Laurie Weiss, and she's a PhD. She's a relationship communication expert and a master certified coach. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Nice to have you. Thank you. All right, and uh, we have on um, Skype, starting from the very left lower corner, Dr. Sh uh, Karen Sherman, PhD, and she's also a relationship expert, and she's joining us from New York City. Welcome to the show, Karen. Hi, Steve. It's so nice to be with you. Awesome to be with you. And right above her uh, would be Ninon de Verderosa, and she's joining us from Los Angeles, the beautiful city of Los Angeles. Welcome to the show. <laughs> it's Nina. beautiful. Thank you. It's lovely. Hello, Dr. Laurie. How Actually, Hollywood, isn't it? Yeah, I'm in the Hollywood Hills. Yep. <laughs> I'm where it all hangs out. <laughs> all right. And Hi, Dr. Laurie. How are you? Pleasure to meet you. I'm great. Nice to meet you, too. Great. And to the right of uh, Ninon uh, would be uh, Donna Mary Thompson, and she's also a PhD. She's a relationship expert as well, and she's joining us from Washington, D.C. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Steve, and welcome, Dr. Lori. I can't wait to chat with you. Thank you. Awesome. And right below, uh, Donna, that would be Jamie Lerner, and she's our self-growth expert, and she's uh, joining us from the beautiful city of Chicago, Oprah Hello. Land. Thank you. Nice <laughs> to be here. Welcome to the show. All right, so this is how the show is going to go. In our first segment, our team is going to share with you uh, what is the Living Consciously TV show is all about? And in the second segment, we'll be discussing, all of us, discussing what the issues and problems are with relationship communication. And then in this third segment, we'll be having a, a conversation about what are the possible solutions and maybe some of the modalities that each one of these experts are using in their own practices to these relationship issues that we talked about or we're going to be talking about in the second segment. So let's get started with what is the Living Consciously TV show is all about and I would like to have Dr. Karen start. Well, uh, I think that what we've all been trying to do is uh, explore from our own perspectives the idea of being present at every given moment, being aware of what we're feeling, what we're thinking, what we're sen sensing and being able, therefore, to 
be aware of everything that is around us. And in the show, we're exploring that from uh, different perspectives that we bring in relationships, finances, health. Um, and it is our hope in this show that as we um, actually live it in the show and try to be as real as we can, that we are not only talking about it, but actually modeling it for people. And in so doing, um, sharing our own awareness and therefore um, opening it up for others to do likewise. Fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Karen. Uh, how about you, um, Nina? Well, living consciously, I think this is sort of at the right time as uh, uh, this has come out because of what's going on in the world, what we've been going through for the past three years with the economy, not only in America, but all over the world. And I think this is a great time for us to realize um, who we are, what we are. And living consciously is this incredible way of bringing it out and letting people know out there that we are concerned, that we are conscious and we are aware of what is going on. We're trying to implement this and trying to get other people to, to understand how we, can, um, how we can give back in this world and how we can understand each moment and how to live each moment as well. It's, it's not a matter of just sort of, you know, getting up every morning and going to work. It's a matter of what you do. It's, I call it a moment in time all the time. And it's like trying to live uh, in the moment of time as well as trying to be conscious of what's out there and other people. And I think what's going on with America especially, I think we're being um, committed to uh, actually being conscious and understanding and making America a better place, making people understand who we are. We do have a voice. We can use it. And I think living consciously is a way of bringing that out of people so they think, oh, okay, that's part of me. I can do that. Whereas if we hadn't had this show and all collaborating together of bringing it out there in a very kind, honest way, I think um, living consciously is incredible. Thank you, Nina. How about you, Jenny? Living consciously is a lovely option, and I think it's the opportunity for us to reconnect with ourselves and to be in the moment and to get in touch with how we're feeling and also giving us an opportunity to express to others and to share the authenticity of who we are, really are and this show I think is a wonderful representation of how that can happen in collaboration with so many um, different perspectives. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, and uh, not last, not least, uh, Donna. Hi. Well, thanks Steve. I consider living consciously a supreme contrast to how I used to live my life, which was unconsciously. So not only does this show, but all of the other tools and techniques that are available now show us a new path, that we're not victims of life or our feelings, so that we do have control of our actions and thoughts. And once we understand that we can enter into conversations, that we can enter into situations, being present, being whole, it's an amazing breakthrough. And um, I'm, I'm really excited that our viewers can witness these wonderful guests that we have with us. So this TV show, I think, is a platform to showcase many, many different perspectives on ways that we can all live more consciously. Fantastic. And, and for me, what it is is really to display to the public what consciousness looks like and what it feels like and the way we uh, feel, the way I feel that we can accomplish that is by being an example, meaning that we actually walk the talk and we do it on the show so that we are connected to ourselves and to each other and we stay ahead of this game, what I call that most people, and in the past, I myself, created my present moment either from the past or from the future. So. Let's get on with the uh, second part of the show, and I have a great question to ask you because I feel that um, the best way to do this is really to be an example, right? Is to take leadership. And so you have this beautiful question on your website, which blew me away from the very first time I saw it. And that question is, what conversations are you avoiding? Oh my, I think that is the essence of what goes on in relationships people are avoiding all kinds of conversations. Um, right now the conversation I'm avoiding <laughs> is being in this TV studio with you. Oh, okay. And that, that, that's the thing that is drawing my consciousness. Okay. And I'm settling in and being here and being present with you. 
Um, I love the question. It's one I ask over and over and over again. Yes, I, I believe that this one question, if everybody actually did it and completed it on the planet, it, could, it, it has the power to transform the entire planet. I think it does too. Yes. Thank you. Yes. So why don't we go around and um, see, uh, we do this based on a volunteering basis because this is an interesting question. So who would like to go first in terms of sharing what conversations are you avoiding from the team, from the experts? And don't everybody volunteer um, all at once. <laughs> 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 what am I? Um, I think what I, I've been trying to avoid is probably, uh, which I'm now definitely addressing, is I've been avoiding myself. Um, I've been avoiding of, of who Ninon is and what do I want to do and where do I want to go and not realizing or even thinking about the abilities I have and how I could really um, do justice out there and help other people. And I have. It's not a matter of avoiding it, it's probably more of acknowledging it and not realizing that, uh, that I can help people out there. And I'm beginning to get onto that track of, you know, it's not all about sort of um, helping other people. I think you have to really be very um, grounded yourself before you can really be out there and give your all. And I've been really working on that an awful lot. And through Steve, actually, um, he's helped me tremendously in sort of getting a little bit more out there and understanding what I can really do. So it's something I've been avoiding and I think it came from my childhood for sure. Um, I had a very different childhood. So I think we're sort of, <laughs> it does take time to get over it. But um, although I've had a successful and incredible life, but understanding Ninon and who she is, I think it's um, about time. So that's what I've been avoiding. And, and, I, and I, of course, am going to say that so much of what we are today is tied into patterns from our childhood that we're not even aware of. And you know, Steve, when you first asked that question, I was thinking, oh, I'm not really avoiding any conversation. <laughs> I pretty much <laughs> say what's on my mind. And I had to think about that. And I, and I realized that what I don't really say is a pattern that I learned from my childhood, which is to not speak up for those things that don't feel comfortable to me, um, to try to please other people and to be able to say it's okay to take care of myself, to set limits and um, that I can do that and I guess that's what's uncomfortable for me, I can do that gracefully um, and not um, hurt other people by taking care of myself as well. Um, but that is an uncomfortable a conversation for me to have um, and again it's tied into my past and something I learned that's just sort of been wired in and and you know quite frankly since that's the thing I talk about all the time about people living on autopilot if I'm going to as Donna said before you know uh, switch over from having lived mindlessly for so many years I think that that's probably my last frontier or maybe there's more that I'm unconscious of that I have to be more awake with as the years start to unfold. Yeah. Okay, that great. might be your first Be frontier. <laughs> Before we continue, yes. I, I'm, I'm feeling that I need to ask a clarification question from, from Dr. Dr. Lori. So what, what came up for me while everybody was sharing is um, I took this question as a question in terms of uh, not necessarily a relationship with ourselves, but a relationship with another person because the conversations that we usually avoiding because we are very good as human beings, I feel, justifying anything to ourselves. So yes. in terms of so avoiding anything, you know, like, like what was just shared just a minute ago by Dr. Karen, the first thing that comes up for people, well, I'm not avoiding anything. <laughs> oh, I, I know of lots of things that I would like to avoid and try not to. Mm -hmm. um, the things that I avoid are when somebody else is uncomfortable and I don't have... A, a real close relationship with them. Mm. I avoid saying something that will make the biggest difference because I'm afraid of intruding on their space. Mm. I avoid conversations with somebody who I think is doing something inappropriate, like littering mm. or parking in a, in a handicapped space because I'm afraid of the kind of um, pushback that I'll get if I do it. Mm. And I know that like there's Like confrontation, a, you mean? Like confrontation, mm -hmm. right. 
And I know that if I took the risk, and when I take the risk, of having these kinds of conversations in a very conscious way, not in a way that says, you're bad, mm -hmm. but in a way that says, that has an impact on me. Um, those are the kinds of conversations, I think, that make the world so much better. I was at the opera yesterday, mm -hmm. and the person in front of me wore such heavy perfume that I was coughing mm -hmm. throughout the whole first act. And I debated, you know, do I say anything? I moved my seat during the second act, but I did say to her later that I don't think you're aware of the impact that your perfume has on some people, and I'm sure you wouldn't want it to have that impact if you knew about it. Mm -hmm. Great. And how did she receive it? She said, oh. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> you know, what, what can you say when somebody says that? It's okay. like, okay, I'm sorry, I didn't May know that. Yes, Steve. Yeah, Steve. Okay. okay. I'm having a little difficulty hearing Dr. Lori. I don't know if there's a way that um, she can, if there's a mic she's using that she can speak into a little bit more. I'm catching most of what she's saying, and I, I know that what she's saying is really important. Yeah. So is there some way that Thanks, that Dr. can be Karen. corrected? Yeah, okay. the, our technical producer already fixed it. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. I guess, right. Steve, what, what Dr. Lori just brought out, it would really triggered for me is the conversations that I avoid is, and it's not for a difficult reason, it's for a time reason. If I encounter people who are really judgmental or negative, um, it's not that I am avoiding them because I don't want to get into the tangle, it's because I know that it would take hours or days to try to fix it. So I find myself deciding, kind of almost in the split second, do I, is this one of my missions? Do I want to take this on? And if it's someone that's really close to me, then I'll invest the time. But if it's someone that's very casual, I'll just pass it aside. I, I really don't want to get into the tangle. So I find myself making those instant judgments. Got it. Thank you. Are you ready, Jamie? I, I am ready. And, you know, I don't really um, avoid any conversation with anybody, but um, I also never expect anyone else to be different for me. So if I have something to say to someone, I say it in the most loving way that I can as a way to express myself, but I never feel responsible for how it will be received, which allows me to really stay in my truth all the time and be my clearest, um, most present self. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Great so, well yeah, as I was checking in with myself, you know, what conversation am I avoiding? What came to me is um, the uh, conversation that I'm avoiding with my youngest. Uh, I have three kids, mm -hmm. and the youngest one is uh, 26. And the, the, the specific conversation that I'm avoiding is, he, he is the one that I had the most conflict with. And it's actually, I would have to say, he is the one that had the most conflict with me. From the very first you know, time when he became a teenager, he, um, he despised me and hated me ever since. And, and he kind of came around, because now he's 26. But there's still, there's still things there that are uncomfortable for me. And, and I think what I, what I need to say to him, the conversation I need to have with him is how much I love him and the fact that um, how, much, how proud am I of him. He is married and has two kids, and one of his kids are not his. And he is the only one that's working, and he's working very hard, and he works overtime to provide and be responsible for this family. And, um, and that I'm very proud of him, and I think he needs to hear that from me. I hope you have that conversation. I will. Yes. I, will. I, I really so do. Too. Very soon. <laughs> I hope so, too. Yes. All right, so let's, let's talk about what are the top three things that um, we can think of as the cast and also uh, Dr. Lori. The top three things that people get into uh, in terms of relationships and communication issues, specifically communication issues. What are the things that get in the way of communication and how do people pay for it? Well, I would say that the first thing is expecting a kind of response that you don't want. And so if you're avoiding that, I was wondering, like, why were you avoiding talking to your son? What kind of, and my thought process, and you do not have to answer this, mm -hmm. was what were you expecting to happen 
if you had that conversation with him. And I, I know that that's what happens with couples all the time. I couldn't tell him because if I told him, he'd be angry at me. Therefore, I went and hid it. So I think mm. that's, that's the first thing, expecting a negative response mm. or a, a difficult response. Which we have no control over ever, by the way. We have no control over how anyone receives the information. I would disagree ever. with that. I, w I would very strongly disagree with that. I think that by uh, how we frame something and how we think about where the other person is, we can have a great deal of impact on what kind of response somebody has. Mm. Yeah, I think it all depends on the tone of voice as well, is how you yes. approach it and how you talk and how you... How you how you expressing what you're trying to say to that person or trying to get out of that person? Um, yes. Because sometimes things aggravate me when they usually come into me and ask me about you know certain things of my life that I have, and I look at them absolutely bewildered because my heritage in England you would never ask that. So you have to kind of readjust, and sometimes as the per person perceiving the question must think a little bit before they answer and not jump in like, you know, a quick answer, which really wasn't probably the truth, but to try to sort of understand where that person is coming from, who is giving it and who is receiving it. And I think just to give that little sort of subtle moment of time, again, um, to try to understand where those people are coming from, because I don't think anybody out there is really um, truly trying to be vindictive or trying to be nasty or trying to be bad, though there are a few of them out there that ask questions for that reason. But I think um, just to try to understand the tone of voice and how it's coming out. I agree Laurie, with you, you completely. Okay. Uh, Dr. Lloyd, are you talking about communication preparation, where, especially in couples, where you set the landscape so that the person is prepared and you're coming in in a calm and kind and curious manner, then there's, there's fertile soil there that at least the conversation can take place in peace. Is that what you're alluding to? Uh, that is certainly an important part of it. But I don't think it just has to be with couples. I think it, it can very well be when you're speaking with somebody and you think about what is going on with them at the moment before you say, and it just takes a second to say, oh, um, that person maybe had a hard day, maybe it's not about me, and to smile. And I also think it's part of the preparation is the thinking kindly of the other person, not just the external circumstances, but the recognizing that this is another human being who's doing the best that he or, can she, he or she can be doing at the moment. But Dr. Laurie, don't you also think, when you think in terms of expectations, and I think that this is where some of the lack of consciousness takes place, that you're not even thinking in terms of the other person, that the expectations are based on whoever you are, where your head is at, what your fears are, what your issues are, you know, from wherever you're coming from. In other words, your own vulnerabilities. I it's think, not even about the other person. I agree. I think that that is the non-conscious or unconscious way to come about it. And I think people can learn that in any conversation, it's not just about you and it's not just about me. It's about both of us and it's about the needs and feelings of both of us. And I think that's a very important thing to start training when children are young and in working with couples. I certainly see what you described, where one of them is thinking up the response while the other one is, you know, speaking it instead of listening. And then when I say, what did you hear? I find that they've heard almost nothing. They yes, picked out exactly. one small piece of a very complicated story and have come up with a response to that piece. And as a part of being, becoming conscious is to sit there, notice what you're feeling while it's happening and do your very best to listen to what's going on and what is coming at you and then take a moment to respond. Yeah. Well, Dr. Uh, Lurie, yeah. I think we have an epidemic of non-listening. Uh, we actually have, have tons of training courses in corporate and couples counseling and everything. And one of the fundamental breakdowns is you're either not listening, framing your next response, or you don't want to hear what they're saying in the first place. That we don't, we, we're not trained to listen. And one of the things that as soon as conflict arises, that's a solid communication breakdown. 
You're absolutely right. Yeah. Well, yes, because the world is changing so much with the computers and everything else that we're getting by this lack of communication going on because we talk to the computer all the time. But just because you're talking to somebody and they disagree with you or they don't, um, you can feel that they don't really care for you. It doesn't mean to say that person's a bad person or you hate that person or that person is terrible. It's just that you don't communicate and you just don't have that vibe of getting on. You, you don't have to put that person down. Um, you don't have to say bad things about that person. It's just that you two don't communicate and sort of just move on, but don't you know elaborate on it and just move on, let that person go. And surround yourself by people that you can communicate with is is far easier, obviously. That, that's definitely easier. But there are also some fallback positions, like when you find yourself reacting to somebody rather than responding to, and by that I mean an emotional reaction that makes you want to say something that's hurtful. You can always yeah. go have a fallback position of asking a question of where did you get your information or what were you doing when you encountered that or gee you seem to be upset can you tell me what I did that upset you rather than oh boy I didn't do anything Dr. Dr. Lori I a hundred percent agree with you but I guess that um, my concern is that, again, that's going to take a very mindful, conscious person who is not reactive, as you said, who's not caught up in their emotions. And I would suggest, you know, we, we started this conversation where you were saying that the conversation you're not having is the one with other people, but that I think that you've got to start having a relationship with yourself first because so many people are not able to have this wonderful communication that you're suggesting because they can't really even relate to themselves first and, and that they need... Oops. Oh, I think we lost, lost our uh, audio. So okay. Okay. Uh, hang on for a second. So, so what I'm getting here, uh, and I just want to reframe this anyway, um, and what I wanted to reframe is that, and correct me if I'm off here, uh, sure. So, so with this, what conversation are you avoiding question, I think, I think what it also means is that it's costing us in many ways not having these conversations and how it's costing us, and I'm speaking for myself right now, is it, it's costing us our aliveness and it's costing us a lot of other things that, that we are unable to do, including perhaps not be conscious as often as we would like to be mm -hmm. because these things uh, that we have incomplete um, relationships about um, are going to show up somewhere in our own lives, yes. correct? Mm -hmm. so, so this incomplete with my son is costing me somewhere. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yes I'm, I'm absolutely aware that when my 13-year-old grandson was visiting and he would go on and on and on and on and rattle on about things, that I didn't have some conversations with him. Like, why are you worried about that? Or why are you telling me that now? I just kind of sat there and nodded and it was nice. And that cost me the chance to be closer to him. Mm -hmm. And maybe it cost him, too, the chance to think about those things mm -hmm. now instead of just having them go around in circles in his head. Right. Right. But, uh, yeah, you're right on that because I deal with children and I think what well, the problem is we have with children and I can understand you, Steve, and sometimes it's the child that has to talk to the parents or whomever's looking after them. But um, I think what, one of the problems we have with our younger generation, especially in this day and age, is that we don't understand how intelligent they are and we do a lot of talking at them instead of talking with them. In other words, sitting back and letting them have their little voices because they take a little time to talk and they, you know, it's and buts and all this and it gets, you know, sometimes it gets a little slow. But we must have the patience to be able to have a conversation with them, not talk at them. And I think that's a big problem we have is yeah. talking at our kids because we belong to them. They yeah, belong to us. Thank you, Nina. Yeah. So, so while I was sitting here and listening to all of you and listening to Dr. Laurie, I, um, I, I thought about, not that I wasn't present with you because I was, but back there somewhere in the intermission, in between words, in between, in between uh, sentences, I thought about what, what is it? What is the cause of me not completing this conversation with my son? Okay? Because I, I still haven't given that up. So, so and what I got in touch with is, you know how we say that we're not going to turn out our parents, but we turn out exactly 
<laughs> like our parents. Okay. <laughs> so I just got in touch with my father has never set me down and never had a conversation with me about how much he loved me. Never. Never. Do you want that? And I don't want that. And I, and I promised myself that I will not ever recreate that with my kids. And I, and I did have that conversation with my daughter, and I did have that conversation with my oldest son, but I never had that conversation with my youngest because I was still holding on to this you know, thing that, well, if I sit him down, and I know all the stuff that we went through, all the things we went through between us, you know, it's like what's, what's up for me is what is going to happen when I say this to him, it's like, what, am I going to survive the feelings right. that I'm going to have? Uh-huh. Yeah. And, and I'm going to probably have tears coming out of my eyes because I'll be not just connecting with him, but with myself and with my father. So there's an opportunity to heal something huge here, I believe. And the reason I'm sharing this is because I think a lot of our viewers can check in with themselves as well and see what conversations are they not avoid are, are they avoiding and, mm-hmm. and what their life will be because that's the part that we haven't talked about once you have this conversation and and I would say that most people have several of these not just one several I I think they can be big and small over and over mm-hmm. and over again I mean I have I there was a time in my marriage when I was desperately, desperately unhappy. And what I was unhappy about was, my, my husband and I were business partners, what we were doing together in our marriage. And I was so afraid that if I said what I thought, that it would end the business, mm-hmm. and it would end the marriage, uh-huh. Uh-huh. and everything. Mm-hmm. And I was just terrified. And so I didn't, I went along with it for quite a long time until I noticed that I was getting to a point where I was quite depressed and I thought, I've got to do something. And so I got, I got ready and I did it and it worked. I mean, we're still married, <laughs> <laughs> almost 51 years now. Wow, congratulations. But, yeah. Fantastic. And the business changed, it changed mm. radically at that point. Mm. Because what I did is I told the truth right. about where my energy was and what I wanted to do. And so every time I've had an experience like that, it builds my strength to have the next experience like that and, and to do the next thing. But I think, you know, the point you said about I wasn't even aware of the things I was avoiding in myself. I wasn't aware that I was avoiding those deep feelings. Many of us do. And I think the part about having the relationship, I mean, we've got a whole bunch of um, conversations that we're having in our own minds all the time. Right. Learning to listen into those and, mm. and see what's important, what isn't. What's from the past? What's, what's a stuck place? Where, where have I got, I got energy that I don't want it anymore and would like to take it back? Those are all important factors. Mm. Yeah. Well, Dr. Laura, you had the courage to take the risk. I think the reason we don't have these major conversations is there's so much at risk. You had a marriage, a business, your entire life was at risk. And so that's a huge conversation. But I think one point that you, I wanted to pull out what you said was that we can have these one huge conversation, but I also work with my coaching clients that we can have small incremental conversations conversations to begin to so even Steve you don't need to have this volcanic eruption conversation with your son you can begin just take him to lunch and just have a father-son experience and as you begin to build that foundation maybe the conversation will occur naturally so it doesn't have to be this we need to talk it can be (laughs) let's begin a journey of open communications And, and I think that's really powerful yeah great do we need yeah. to talk thing? <laughs> <laughs> the four most dreaded words. That's always trouble. Okay. Oh, I don't even know, Steve, that you have to say that we have to talk. Just yeah. start talking. Just talk. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and you know, I I'm sorry, my my uh, Skype went out for a while, so I may be redundant in some things that were said. But Dr. Lori, I heard you say two things that were really of interest to me. Number one that you do it little by little and then you gain the confidence to do it more and more. And I think for most of us, these feelings are so hard for us because we feel so vulnerable. 
but that when you try it a little bit, you know, your mate likewise is feeling that same vulnerability, but that's how we really create our emotional intimacy when we open up and we take a little step. And I, I know from my experience with myself and with my clients that when you start to do that, that feels so beautifully connecting that that allows the flow to start. So I apologize if I've been redundant by missing a piece in there. For, no for, for me, you actually brought up something that's very close to my heart, which is uh, giving couples the stems from which to have those conversations. This whole book is all about that. It's all about 125 different conversations that people can have that are of um, low risk or maybe higher risk, but you can start wherever you want to mm. and learn to build and learn what steps to take. Because, so, you know, yeah. Communication so that, yeah. as a process. I think we, we've, we've gotten into this black or white situation where if communication is a process, we can begin anywhere, anytime. Yes. Yeah, which brings me to actually the, the next subject I want to talk about, which is uh, arguments and how do we stop them and why would we even want to? Why would we want to stop the arguments? Mm -hmm. um, it depends on what you mean by an argument. Well, I can speak from my own experience. So an argument would be like, um, you know, talking about, um, and this is something couples do a lot, I think, because uh, I did it. Um, where are we going to go for dinner? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then she says, "Well, I don't know. Where do you want to go?" And then then I go, "Well, I asked you first. <laughs> That's already an argument. <laughs> it already is. It, al it already is. And and I tell my clients something that whoever has the idea to do something first uh -huh. has to come up with the first suggestion. <laughs> it works pretty well." I had an example with my husband. He used to suddenly get into these awful moods and start screaming and yelling. And I would leave the room and then I would come back and he'd start yelling and screaming again. I still, I'd still leave the room and smile and leave the room again. And then he suddenly said, why do you keep le leaving the room? <laughs> and I said, well, I said, I can't talk to you. I said, until you calm down, until I can understand. So I, my philosophy is don't feed in. If somebody else is mad and angry, don't feed into it and become mad and angry because you weren't in the first place anyway. He was or she was. And so it was very I got him calmed down. I said, just please tell me what is wrong. And I will either apologize and say I'm sorry or I'll tell you misunderstood what I said. And then we would have the conversation. It was kind of sorted out. But it was, um, I never fed into an argument because if they're angry and mad, then why would you, you're not, why would you go and be angry and mad? Start a whole fiasco of, of two people arguing. Unfortunately, Steve, I have felt, I have fed into many arguments. I have taken the bait, jumped in, and it's taken a long time to learn how to step back and leave the room or, or take a deep breath and say, why have you raised your voice? Is it something that I did? Or what's the problem with what you're saying? How is that a problem for you? Uh, but it's taken a long time. Right. Well, I think that's one of the keys. One of the keys is those physical signals. If you're triggered, the first thing you can do as a conscious person to say, what is it that they said and why am I being triggered? And that's your time to step back. But Steve, I envy you if the biggest argument in your marriage was about where to go for dinner. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but he didn't tell us the finish of it. No, no, no. <laughs> we only no, heard like the beginning. I'm not, I'm not going there. So I'm, okay, I'm going to actually okay. bring up another example, which I just, okay. I just had not long ago, which, which it just showed to me how much I have grown, which is because I also used to go and jump into these these things when somebody it, it is just like fishing. Yeah, it's a mm -hmm. hook and you either take the bait uh, and when you do, well, you're in it. Eric Byrne described you, it in games people play 40 years ago. Yeah, yeah you're in it. So, so this person calls me on the phone and starts yelling at me. And within a couple of seconds, I stop and say, just a moment. Uh, this does not work for me, okay? So we can hang up right now, and then you can call me back when you can talk to me as a decent human being, and uh, your choice. So hang up or okay, and change that, the tone, please. Which I think is wonderful, because what that is, 
is instead of having to go through the things yourself first and do all that, you, re you react. Right. In but the past, I would yell back. But you react. Because you NLP, re NLP taught me that the best thing to do is mirror the person. Right. <laughs> Well, no, that's not the best, but that's an option. That's an option. Yeah. <laughs> right. But but there is something that you did. That the person said something to you, and you essentially said, ouch. And that, I think, is the step that's left out. Instead of saying, ouch, what we do is say, I'm going to get you back for what you did. And I think the most important thing is to learn how to say, uh-oh or that doesn't work, or I don't know how to respond, or, or something like that. Mm -hmm. I think that's critical. I think, you, I think the cast has tons to say. Yeah, but well, you, you accepted that signal. And then what you did is short-circuited. By being aware, you short-circuited and prevented the entire argument. I will not accept that behavior. I won't go into this conversation like this. And so if we can begin to learn to do that faster and faster, there can be the end of all arguments. But I must defend NLP. The technique was to build rapport. And if you want to build rapport with a willing person, you use mirroring. But under no other circumstances, especially not in a heated exchange. <laughs> <laughs> if we're if we're going to help people by taking little steps, what I would like to suggest is that the reality is that as we're moving towards mindfulness and less emotional reactivity, that the best that we can do perhaps initially is after we've taken the bait, become more mindful of what that experience was about for us and come back to it and then at least speak openly about what the experience was for us honestly, openly, authentically, and at least use that conflict to get back in touch with each other. And I think at least that's a good starting point so that, you know, we're moving in the right direction because I think, Steve, what you said was wonderful, but for many of people out there, it's not, we're not up to that yet. So we can, again, move in that direction. And I think that's a good starting point for people to be able to look back and say what was going on for us. Yeah, yeah, I great. think we always put Thank up you. this defense, you know, we always put up this defense thing and we always want to protect ourselves, but I've always felt the greatest thing to do is that I've got something going on and uh, let's call you back later and sort of try to address it when everybody's a little bit more calm, <laughs> which is avoiding the situation. Right. Well, uh, we, we have been actually talking about solutions and, uh, and uh, some modalities of how to help our viewers to get better at relationships, specifically um, communications within relationships. And um, I, I'd like to go back to something that we, we talked about at the beginning, beginning of the show, which is listening. I think listening is, is an art. Yes. And, and I think we should spend a few more minutes on how we, how we could help and assist our viewers how to listen better. So who would like to uh, start? Mm. How about you, doctor? <laughs> right. I was ready to you're listen. The, you're the perfect I was person. Ready to listen. <laughs> Get yourself all ready there. <laughs> you're right next Surprise. to me. Yeah. Uh, I, I think one of the ways to listen is to feel safe in the first place mm -hmm. and for people to do what they can do to know that if I listen, I don't have, it doesn't mean I'm agreeing, it doesn't mean I'm making a commitment to do anything. It just means that I'm listening. And, and to know that listening to somebody, just listening is a gift. It's one of the biggest gifts you can give to another person. How do we create the safety that you're referring to? Um, part of it is knowing ourselves. You know, there, there are a million ways. Part of it is creating the room, you know, uh, planning it. Part of it is thinking about who the other person is, mm. uh, you know, the Hawaiian thing of, I love you. Mm. Just, just mm -hmm. thinking about that, thinking about the love in the world. There are a million ways to stop and think, okay, this isn't going to happen. Um, all the things that I'm worried about are not going to happen. And very often, I think all of us as helpers can help other people to take a step back and say, what is it that I'm really, really afraid of here? What's the likelihood that that's going to happen? What will I do if it does happen? And that in itself, just that thinking through ahead of time, provides a great deal of safety. 
Mm. Do you feel safe right now? Yes. Yes. I'm here she does, now. She does now. Well, I know. <laughs> I know. But what? Just can you? Could you share with uh, the viewers and the cast what what is making you uh, feel safe? Well, the first thing that was making me feel safe was when you told me that all I had to do was come and be authentic and be me. Because <laughs> that's the easiest thing in the world yes. for me at this stage. It wasn't always, mm. but it is now. Um, the other thing is listening to these other ladies. Because, you know, everybody is trying to accomplish something. Everybody is very much involved in a goal that I completely support. And we agree on what the goal is, even though we may disagree on the means to the goal or aren't, haven't had that conversation. Mm -hmm. So I'm very safe with that. Um, in terms of this being a safe physical environment, it's just fine. I've got my water here. Um, <laughs> okay. And I don't, and I've got somebody in the control room who will take care of my voice so I don't have to worry about it. Mm -hmm. And I don't have to worry about holding a microphone. And if somebody says I, I wave a microphone and that's not good, and I don't have to worry about having notes and remembering what I'm going to say. Mm -hmm. So all of those things help. Great. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. So what about any, anybody else on our cast? Uh, what would you recommend to our viewers in terms of how to get better at listening? Well, I think um, I've had a TV show for some time, and one of the things you really, really, really have to do is listen to that person talking, because if you don't listen to them and you're wandering off on something else, you do not have a show because you're not paying attention to that person. So I think what, what we sort of do is when we're talking to somebody who really are not paying attention, we're probably thinking, what are we going to answer them all the time? And we're not really focused on them. But it is a very hard thing to focus on somebody 100% and really, really get into their conversation and really listen to them. And uh, it, it's, it's tough to do that and it's very, very hard. But it's, it's, um, it makes a beautiful conversation when you really are talking to somebody and having a great conversation. It's, uh, I, I managed to have that with my father and most definitely with my mother for the last three years of her life. Uh, we became very, very connected and I just decided that I really wanted to listen to her, understand her and listen more than talk and that's what I did and it's, it's, the most in, it's a very fulfilling thing to have within you, to have that settlement in you that you did accomplish listening to somebody and you understood where they were coming from rather than assuming and listening to them of what their voice instead of your voice. Steve, I also think there's if you have a genuine interest in curiosity, everybody at every station in life has something to share and experiences that you've not been familiar with. So if just for 30 seconds you could focus on what they're saying and really try to integrate mm -hmm. it, I think that's it's a, an amazing offering. And you'll be so surprised at what you'll pick up. And I think for me, um, and I... You know, as a psychologist in private practice, I, I have to really make sure that I'm listening. Um, I have to make sure that in my own thoughts as I'm listening, that I'm really not with me, but with the other person. Um, you know, it's so easy to be privately thinking about, well, what am I going to make for dinner, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. or, you know, somebody said something to me and what do they mean by that or whatever. So it's really putting myself aside and truly paying attention and being present to the other person. So I bring that, you know, to my clients and to the friends or the other people that I'm meeting. So it's pretty much just putting yourself aside and being present for the other person. This is a beautiful feeling. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, uh, I wanted to add a few things to this. So, so one of the things that comes up for me is uh, what you said, Dr. Karen, which is quieting down the conversation inside our head which um, I think statistics that I've seen and, and read about in the past is that usually people only get less than 10% of what somebody else is saying, which is pretty uh, sad. Um, no wonder that we are having <laughs> all these problems in communication uh, and relationships. So, so quieting that internal, ma managing our minds, I think, is what yeah. we're talking yeah. about, right? And then, then the other thing, which is kind of interesting for me, I, I wanted to share that too, is is putting ourselves in the other person's position. Like, is that mm -hmm. possible, Doctor? Yes. Yes. For a moment. Right. What we can do is just imagine, well, what, what was this person going through today? Mm -hmm. Just a little bit. We can't get fully into it, but we, right. can, we can certainly empathize. 
Right, and we're, I'm, I'm we're even born talking to about, do that. I'm even talking about body language. Like right mm -hmm. now, I, I turn more to you, and I'm leaning forward, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm not over here. I'm trying to be over there with you. Right. Right. And, and you're speaking to me, and I'm trying to put myself into, in your shoes, basically, is what mm -hmm. you're talking about. Yeah. Okay. And then what could happen if, if people can actually do that in their mind, quiet their mind down, so they're not thinking about all the stuff that they're mm -hmm. going to do or not going to do or whatever, and then actually getting out of their own, own body and mind and getting over to the person that's talking to them, what could happen? Do, do you think that there could be some magic that could be happening? You know, you said to me before we started that having the grandchildren around is the greatest gift. And I think it's because they are doing that. Mm -hmm. And you feel so connected when they do that to you. They're not worrying about what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. They just say, Grandpa, yeah. what, you know, how come your hair is that color? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Can I have your glasses? <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. and they just say it. And you go, oh. Uh -huh. You know, you're yeah. so real and present mm -hmm. with me. You're focused on me. Right, right. And, and, I think, and I think what some of that magic could be is we could hear things that the other person is not even saying. Oh, absolutely. All we have to mm -hmm. do, I mean, that, that's where some of the mirroring comes in. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, right. if, if we pay attention, then we get where, where they're coming from. Yeah, yeah. The body, body language. Yeah, that, mm -hmm. that's awesome. Yeah. All right, so uh, I, I know I asked earlier that what are the three things, and we may not have time to finish this, but what are the top three things that get into um, communication issues in relationships? And I think we talked about, talked of, about a few of them. Obviously, one is listening. Mm -hmm. uh, anything else that you can think of? Um, one to me is a very basic belief about a relationship. And the relationship is it's either about me. This, this is the cultural belief. It's either about me or it's about you. And most relationships are that way, particularly new relationships. And so I think what people need to learn is that they don't have to give up themselves to be in a relationship. And they don't have to give up the relationship in order to be themselves. I think that is the most profound, basic thing, that it's possible to be who you are and be in a relationship with another person, and that is one of the most beautiful things that can happen to anybody. Mm -hmm. oh, that's, that's oh, I awesome. agree. That's awesome. Yeah. That, that happened to me and my husband. It was the most incredible relationship we had. We were married for 29 years, and um, I was what I wanted to be, and he was what he wanted to be, and we never questioned each other. It just floated, and I just wish everybody could be like that, because it's beautiful. We have but, moments, though. <laughs> but I think it really makes a difference when you're in a loving, connected relationship with yourself. Then you are so able then to go on and connect with someone else in a much deeper and loving way. So I think every relationship that we have really starts with the relationship that we have with ourselves. Yeah, I, I, I must be a great catch these days because... <laughs> I I have never <laughs> I <laughs> all the relationships I've been in I I've been not awake and I was not conscious and I and I didn't practice any of these things that that now I do so I just wanted to make that publicly clear. <laughs> Are you doing that as a way of bidding, Steve? Steve is available on Denver cable. I know a lady in Las, in Las Vegas. You should meet. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Lori is already thinking about hooking me up. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I'm just I'm just getting kind of anxious because I, I feel I, I feel that I have grown so much in my life and I'm so different than what I used to be that um, um, actually it's um, I'm just ready is what I'm saying. <laughs> Am Ladies, I clear? do you hear that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so with that, uh, that's really all the time we have for today. And uh, uh, many, many thanks to all of our viewers, as well as our guest, Dr. Lori Weiss. Thank you very much for being here. And, My pleasure. Uh, as, well, as well as, uh, uh, of course, all of our cast members, thank you very much for all of you to show up. And really, that's what this is all about, is... is I'm just being connected to what it's really about is showing up 
You know, the, the, the very first thing we have to do in relationships, right, we got to show up. Mm -hmm. And then we have yeah. to be able to be show present. Up, pay attention. Pay attention. Listen and be present. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of a kind of a summary of what we did for this entire hour, and um, of course, many thanks to uh, John there behind the behind the glasses for our technical production. And um, I want to I want to make sure that everybody knows that, uh, and I want to remind everybody that uh, although this show is live right now on Channel Fifty Six, um, it will be played on several channels on Channel Fifty Seven and Two Nineteen. And our shows actually play more often if you uh, go to our website at www.leavingconsciously.tv and actually vote for our shows and also comment for our shows. And uh, we also want to invite you to interact with us on our website and you can just uh, become a free member of our membership uh, site and uh, get our newsletters uh, about what's going on with our cast, what's going on with the shows, what's going on with our guests, who's coming, who's going. And uh, you can just interact with us. And what's cool in the membership uh, site that you can actually um, interact behind the scenes with the cast. And I think that's, uh, that's pretty cool. So you can develop relationships uh, with every one of us, including me, the producer, and the, uh, and the host, and the moderator, and every each individual uh, cast member that you are attracted to. So again, thank you very much. And until next time. Thank you for watching the Living Consciously TV show. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Delightful. Hello, I'm Donna Marie Thompson, PhD of BouncingBackNow.com. I'd plans? like to welcome yeah. you to the Living Consciously TV show, where each week we explore interesting life issues, including health, wealth, happiness, relationships, and above all, living consciously. So what is the effect of living fully 85% of our lives on autopilot? And how could our lives be changed if we were attuned, if we were aware, if we knew what was going on around us, if we were living consciously? Well, I invite you to tune in each week to view our panel of experts and our featured guest as we explore these and other exciting issues. I guarantee that at the end of each show, you'll begin to live your life more consciously.